Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Jingtao Wang. I joined Google uh, last May. Before that, I was a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, my primary interests include on-device machine learning and AI in education. I'm also interested in using machine learning to solve real-world problems. And this is what I'm working on nowadays. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Boya. Uh, I've been working at Google for more than seven years. Uh, before that, I was uh, a PhD student doing uh, data mining application for software testing. Uh, the work I'm doing here is also kind of similar-ish because I'm not really an ML researcher, but our team is uh, kind of utilizing ML and, uh, and uh, natural language understanding for solving a lot of problems. Uh, specifically, our team is working on uh, shopping cart understanding. So we do use uh, machine learning technology to help us understand what people are talking about uh, when, they're, when, they, when they have a shopping tent. Um, and we also use a lot of data mining technologies to discover uh, new shopping concepts from, from large scale, large amount of text. So um, in general, very excited about ML and uh, we have a lot of very close collaborations with uh, research teams at Google. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Daniel Golovin. I work in the brain team here in Pittsburgh. I started out, so I have a background in theoretical computer science. I came to Google, uh, started working in ads, learned about very large scale machine learning um, here, working for a couple of years, and then started trying to auto -wait, automate away uh, large parts of my job, which led, eventually led me to work on things like Vizier. These days, I spend a lot of time working on machine learning driven optimization. Um, and I, I enjoy working with a broad range of, of Google teams, r really across, across all the, of Google, um, trying to make their systems and products better. Cool, thank you very much. And so anybody wanna jump in? Uh, any questions right off the bat? Because I can kick one off just to get us started. So and this is for anybody on the panel. Where do you see uh, machine learning and AI in the next five years and then the next 10 years. It's a kicker right off the bat, I know. All right, I'll, I'll take it. No back. wrong answers here, no wrong answers. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's kind of precarious to predict that far out given how quickly the field is moving. Um, but I, I see a lot of work on, you know, I think the relationship between people and a lot of these systems will change a bit, where uh, a lot of the computer systems will become more of partners in creating things. Uh, I notice a lot of the work on like generative adversarial networks are kind of interesting in terms of giving machines a creative sense. Uh, there's already some interesting work on I mean, you see it in, in things like video games where you have systems try to synthesize entire environments. Um, you can try to do that based on various conditioning. Uh, you, you can imagine um, these systems kind of partnering with people in terms of designing uh, various things um, and kind of optimizing them in various dimensions and, and improving their performance. I think we'll see a lot more of that. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Um, I think, um so I, this is, you know, predicting the future, but yeah, I, I don't think like I'm really in the position of doing that, but like for, from my work experience, I think it's definitely um, machine learning is going to start using more and more and more data. So like that scalability is just really important. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of these new kind of new state of the art MLs, like, like bird models is really um, scaling to a, to, a, to, a, to a degree like a um, magnitude of order of uh, order magnitude bigger than, than what we have the, in the past. Um, so I think uh, alongside of like uh, utilizing much more and more data, there's also, I, I think a lot of hardware side development is going to uh, make much more improvements to, to be able to um, have much larger scale uh, and a lot of compute, computing power to support such kind of, such kind of scale. All right, here are some of my personal opinions on what's important <laughs> within the next few years, just personal opinions. First, I see there should be a shift from benchmark-driven tasks to requirement-driven ta driven tasks. When I see benchmark-driven, for example, object detection, object classification, or blue score-based machine translation, 
These are well-defined tasks. Uh, after certain uh, the technology improve on those tasks, we will be shifting more towards requirement-driven tasks, driven by real-world requirement rather than a well-defined variable metric. This is one thing. Another thing is about making machine learning more practical. We have seen the power of big data, but what if small data? Not every task has big data. In many situations, we need to solve important problems that only have a small amount of data. Meanwhile, such problems are so important, and people will try their best to attack your system, to generate adversarial input. How should we design our model to be more robust in a small data set? and be robust to adversarial input, it will be really important. The third thing I believe that's extremely important is, I believe nowadays uh, the machine learning algorithm is really good at perception tasks. When I say perception tasks, it was, there was a definition by Andrew In. That's a task, for example, an average human can complete in one or two seconds. But there is no way for example, for the current algorithm to do something that requires reasoning, as simple as counting. For example, tell me how many dogs are there in this picture. This is a trivial task for human, but we still cannot do that reliably with today's algorithm. Similarly, learn an algorithm to be able to uh, answer questions like A plus B equals to C. Again, this is more than perception. It requires some level of uh, logical reasoning, and I believe that will be extremely important to push today's algorithm to the next level to address some of the really important tasks we are facing. To teach uh, algorithm how to count. So it looks like we have a question over there. Cool. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, raise your hand and we'll run a mic to you. Anybody? Uh, yeah. So it's basically the same question, but follow up, if you would put a you know, number to it, integer number, how many years till we get human level of intelligence? Your personal opinion. <laughs> Gotta think about that one. Yeah, uh, so I, I don't know exactly how I would answer this because well, it's, it's not such a well-defined problem, right? Like we already have, like it depends on what aspects, like what human capabilities you, you consider to be important, right? So in many aspects, hmm? Five years old. Five years old. To do anything a five-year-old can do. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, the uncertainty is so great, right? I, I don't know. Um, 50 years. Can we like, just get back to this like in 50 years and see who's right or anything? <laughs> okay. um, I think it's going to be faster than we think. <laughs> uh, I think if you go back to 10 years, if you think about uh, autonomous cars, it's not something that people would imagine. Uh, but like the ro robot industry has been improving in a much faster speed than anyone could imagine. I think it's going to be really faster than anyone else would expect. So I would, from that logic, I would guess 48 years. <laughs> uh, my estimation is uh, to achieve that goal, we need another huge breakthrough, just like what we had in terms of deep neural network. Deep neural network itself is not enough. We need something at this level, another one, that can complement what we have in deep neural network. And it's hard to predict what that breakthrough is and how long it will take. It can be as uh, soon as five years, 10 years. It can take longer. But personally, I think I'm a little bit optimistic. Maybe 20 years, not 50 years. Sometimes, if we are lucky, it can be five years, 10 years. We just need another breakthrough. But it's hard, really hard to time such a breakthrough and name such a pre breakthrough. Thank you. 
So uh, I'm excited about autonomous cars and my uh, little robot lawnmower has saved me a lot of time, uh, but not everyone <clears throat> is so excited. And I want to ask about one thing I'm a little bit concerned about is um, automated you know, uh, stock trading and how we can put some policy or regulatory guidelines and, and from a security aspect, both policy and, and cybersecurity, um, what kind of thoughts do you guys have on the kind of cutting edge of both things I'm excited about and things that I worry about myself? So I can talk about one thing that I am, you know, slightly worried about, you know, uh, development of AI in particular. Um, I feel like one thing that distinguishes um, human and machine is the creativity. So I think we can definitely utilize machines to help do a lot of things that uh, need large scale like computation, you know, the, the kind of things that kind of exceed human capability, but they are, they are largely repetitive in my mind. But uh, one thing worries me is, is that, you know, you teach machine to be creative. You're teaching them to, um, you know, there's lots of you know, research going on for teaching machine to create artwork and create music, right? There are even things that create, uh, create uh, fictional actors that can play in movie. So those type of things kind of is something that, that, that I'm worried about. Like if, if machine is starting to get at the same level creative creativity as, as humans, um, I. You know, that's kind of a word that, that scares me. Yep. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure I quite understood the, the question. It's, um, you went in, like you asked one question about what policy guardrails you'd put around algorithmic trading, for example. For example. Yeah. Well, I mean, for that, I guess it, it depends on, in, in some sense, that's a, a political question, right? Um, you know, the, the algorithmic trading, it just enables people to make these trade, trades much faster. Um, so you might say, well, okay, we want to make sure that, that people are in the loop so they can make sane decisions. Um, that's fine, but like collectives of human beings can also make rather um, irrational decisions, right? Like markets can be irrational even if individual people are. Right, like the you know the, the, the famous tulip crash of um, you know that uh, of centuries ago in in the Netherlands, right? Um, so I, I guess I would probably recommend similar policies that prevent those sort of crashes in an algorithmic age. We just have to maybe automate the policy enforcement in some way so that they can re so that the policy can respond in the same time scales as the algorithms. Right, but I'm not sure that, that these present kind of fundamentally new challenges. Um, Hi, wh what new sorts of jobs do you see coming out of any sort of AI revolution in the future? Uh, I see this like, uh, as a huge opportunity it's an opportunity as big as the invention of automobile or airplane. Automobile made us much easier to go from point A to point B. Uh, aircraft made us even faster to make a lot of international business travel possible. Uh, the current revolution in AI made it possible to solve many of the perception tasks that was not possible to solve uh, 80 years ago. Something as simple as a real human that can solve in two seconds, but the computers just couldn't solve it 80 years ago. Now those things become possible. I can imagine that a lot of things, for example, that couldn't be automated will be automated. That uh, there are a lot of things that, for example, uh, computers has it plays zero role. In the past, the primary contribution about computers is mostly about storage about automation, it's about uh, connectivity. Now we can solve some of the perception-based tasks. I can imagine that a lot of, for example, opportunities will be created in uh, manufacturing, in farming, in uh, animal raising, et cetera. And we can significantly increase the scale, convert something uh, that was not scalable to things that are scalable with the help of both algorithm and some of the administrators. So I see this more like a great opportunity. 
uh, it's more about asking us with the power of human, one second human perception, what can we do with computers now? We just opened a new door and we haven't explored sufficiently enough. It may take us maybe five to 10 years to figure out the additional power of one second perception, what it can contribute to our community. Yeah, so it, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, it's kind of, again, it's hard to predict exactly how the economy will evolve over time. Um, you know, if you study things like the Industrial Revolution or electric, like when electricity was introduced, it actually took a fair amount of time for people to uh, kind of reorganize society in ways that actually like utilize the surplus appropriately, right? Um, the Industrial Revolution kind of made everybody wealthier, but it took a while, like about 40 years in that case. In the case of electricity usage, uh, it took essentially a new generation to realize that they could redesign factories in order to leverage electricity effectively. Um, so we're, I think we've gotten better at these things. We had, our, our society adapts much more rapidly than, than the society of you know, 150 years ago, say. Um, but it's, it's still kind of difficult to predict. Um, in the short term, obviously it helps to have you know, there, there are jobs actually building these systems and making them more efficient and, and kind of just increasing productivity in general. Um, so if you have the skills to like be a developer, that certainly helps. Um, longer term, it, it kind of depends on what people value, right? So uh, a, f a few, like, you know, back this past summer, I went to an art fair and there are a bunch of people who were making handcrafted, uh, you know, handcrafted sculptures or paintings or other things and selling them to, to other people, right? And you might ask, well, you know, why do you want a, a handmade wooden chair, right? Like, is it really better quality than what you can buy in like some mass man manufactured, you know, furniture store? Um, and like, well, and in, in objectively, like, you know, you can sit on both of them, but people still sort of value the finely handcrafted uh, chair or the, you know, hand painted uh, painting. So maybe the future looks like that, where people, there's, there's a large artisanal uh, class that's just uh, churning out kind of interesting art and music and so on. Um, but it, it is kind of hard to tell exactly how things will develop. Yep. Okay, so this question is for Daniel. So as a member of um, Google, Group, Google Brain Pittsburgh, um, so that's two sub questions. How is the interaction and collaboration with like top um, ML people in the world like Jeff Dean and Geoffrey Hilton, and um, also how is the interaction with Google Brain and DeepMind? Uh, yeah, so the Brain team is fairly large now. Um, you know, I certainly enjoy uh, interacting with um, Jeff and Jeff. Uh, let's see, um, but it, I mean, there is a, it's a large group. There are lots of projects going on. Um, I think that there's, there's a wide range of people that do fundamental research and work on kind of the underlying technology, right? So some people are very focused on uh, kind of foundational research in well, all aspects of, of deep learning and machine learning. And others are working on TensorFlow. Uh, other people are working on, my group is working on some of these core technologies around black box optimization and contextual bandits and reinforcement learning, both on the research side and on the infrastructure side. Um, so I think it's 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 a great, I mean it's a great group to be in. I, I, am, I feel very privileged to be part of that particular group. Um, in terms of the interactions with DeepMind, you know we do like my group actually does work with or collaborate with some folks in DeepMind. Um, there are various connections. It is true that geography, uh, it's easier to collaborate with people that are in your time zone or at least a similar time zone. Um, so the fact, like certainly between California and London, there's quite a bit of a difference in time zones. And I think that that, that does um, make it a little bit more difficult to collaborate. Um, that's less of an issue for us here on the, you know, in Pittsburgh on the, in Eastern time. Um, but yeah, the, the DeepMind does retain its own kind of identity. They have their own research agenda. Um, uh, but I think that both groups work together nicely. So a uh, question from here. 
Uh, this question is kind of a follow up from Dr. Wang's uh, just mentioned a one sec uh, perception. So I think a big issue in human computer interaction is the perception, how people perceive these AI technologies. And, and a big issue was the trust issue. Like people, people usually doesn't trust those system. Part of is because the system was not that reliable and sometimes it broken up or it performs un unpredictably. And also is that there, as you said, there needs a revolution of changing people's perception towards these machines. And they, for example, a chatbot, a conversational agent. So people, when they are using the conversational agent, do they really trust the results, the, the, the agent back to them. So, uh, so I guess my question is, um, we have the technologies here and it can work, uh, it works in, in some logic, but the human's perception might come later and how do you connect the human's perception into our building of this technology and how do you influence human's life in this way? Yeah. Uh, this is an excellent question. I would try to answer it from multiple aspects. The first one is, uh, in, uh, in order to make the algorithms more trustworthy, we have a lot of things to do. For example, most of the deep neural networks are treated as a black box with uh, hundreds of millions of parameters. Why it generate uh, prediction A versus prediction B? Without a clear and reasonable explanation, it's hard for human to trust the output. Uh, we also believe this is an extremely important thing that uh, may prevent the adoption of uh, machine learning algorithms. And in the research community, we call that interpretable machine learning, or uh, interpretable deep learning. And this is an emerging and extremely hard direction. And uh, we are making progress in terms of understanding the output in uh, deep neural networks. And in many situations, such as finance, uh, healthcare, there are law regulations requiring, for example, we have a explanation about certain predictions. For example, if we predict uh, the patient has a 90% chance to have a lung cancer, you cannot just uh, output lung cancer uh, 90%. You need to give specific reasons why you make such kind of prediction. Without that, uh, the patient won't believe you, their family members won't believe you, doctors won't believe you either. This is one thing. Another thing in terms of trust, I would say uh, it's, also, uh, it's about the weakness about our human being. In many situations, it's not about not enough trust. In many situations, it's about too much trust, especially if something is freezed in a way that could uh, elicit your fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Even if that specific output or message makes no sense, a human being has the nature to trust that. Because, just because such a message can elicit fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's built into our DNA. And how can we make, for example, uh, information source more reliable? How can we, for example, uh, make sure that people are thoughtful about certain messages? Uh, fake news is another thing we really need to pay attention to within the next couple of years. Again, each of them is a big problem and require a huge amount of efforts to solve. Uh, I'll, I'll add a little bit of color there. Um, there are a number of efforts to try to make the results of models more trustworthy. Um, you know, there, there's an enormous amount of work on model interpretability and various approaches there and making models, kind of forcing them to explain why they reach certain conclusions. 
um, and adding sort of certain constraints to how they make predictions or, or what their outputs look like. Um, and, and just in general, like tools to kind of deeply inspect what the models are actually learning. Um, and so I, I think that this is an important line of work and it'll continue. Uh, it, it's kind of funny in some areas of AI, there's kind of a natural tendency for certain people to hype things and then some people buy into the hype and actually like trust too much. And in other scenarios, people really trust too little and actually prevents like uh, systems that could actually do a lot of good from being deployed. Um, but uh, like certainly, so for example, in, in Google, there's a large uh, organization focused on um, like AI for medical applications and they are uh, painfully aware of the need to kind of make these predictions in a safe and reliable way and grounded in like good medicine in a ways that, that the physicians can understand. So there's a lot of interesting work on, okay, uh, like are you going, if you diagnose like a, a lung tumor or something from some image, can you actually highlight exactly which pixels you think are the evidence for uh, a tumor, right? And then you, you can get like these super high, fit, high resolution scans uh, in some cases and instead of having some doctor kind of carefully scan through the whole thing, you can just sort of highlight in red, like these are the problematic pixels and then they can very easily spot check the machine's predictions. So it's, it's definitely a very active area. Okay, um, as ML is being applied to problems in all sorts of you know, new and novel domains, what problem do you think it has the best chance at addressing in like the next five years? Uh, I mean, so uh, some people have compared like AI or machine learning this day, these days to something like electricity, right? When you introduce electricity in society, it, it's difficult to say, like if someone asked, okay, you know, what is the one thing electricity will solve in the next five years? It's kind of difficult to come up with a single answer. I think a lot of these things are, there's a gradual evolution, right? There's an evolution of the technology, there's an evolution of the industries and how they use the technology. Um, and, and so it's, and, and, and this is happening in a lot of different areas of society simultaneously. So it's, it's difficult. And also when there are solutions, it's not as simple as, you know, sprinkle some ML dust and the problem goes away, right? It's usually a concerted effort that involves um, careful engineering, careful policy planning, uh, various other aspects, and kind of AI and machine learning are, are part of the solution and not the entirety of the solution. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, I don't know if I can give an answer about a particular problem. Um, also, these systems often make things better uh, as opposed to just going from uh, no solution to solution. Um, but you know, we see a lot of work on um, AI solutions are getting better and better at modeling. Um, you, know, you do better models for climate science. You do better models for materials design. Uh, you can build various things. Maybe you can make uh, better batteries uh, using these things. So I, I'm, I'm interested in like using machine learning for design. So a lot of my answers are, are skewing in this direction. But if you think about things like climate change or making um, a move to more sustainable energy sources, there are a number of areas where ML and AI can help there in terms of, like I said, the climate modeling, uh, designing better batteries, designing better solar panels, all of this other work. Um, and, I, and I imagine that there are a lot of other kind of areas where you can make a similar kind of story about these technologies kind of making um, gradual improvements uh, in, in various industries. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'm extremely optimistic about what AI can do within the next five years. On one hand, there are some low hanging fruits, such as leveraging those kind of one second perception power there will be a lot of opportunities in those factories to automate, for example, inspection, assembly, et cetera. Nowadays, many of those tasks require uh, uh, workers. It can be automated. Those are some of the low hanging fruit. In addition to low hanging fruit, I'd like to point another thing that's not relevant to technology. It's relevant to uh, people's belief. I believe, for example, uh, to make uh, any change in the future. It's not just 
as simple as inventing a technology. It's a combination of technology, policy, and experiments. In, for example, 10 years ago, even if you believe something is possible, especially in the enterprise environment, a lot of, for example, uh, real problems in the uh, large enterprise environment can be solved with today's technology. But we didn't give them a chance because we didn't believe it, it was solvable. But nowadays with the technology breakthrough, I think there were a lot of mindset change gave us additional opportunities to try to solve some of the easy real world problems. Those problems were solvable in the past, but we may not have the confidence to use a machine learning based approach to solve that. And with the increased confidence, we think that a lot of those problems may be solved, especially in the enterprise computing environment. Um, I think those are great answers. I learned a lot. Um, so um, I think this is like, as Daniel said, this is extremely hard to predict. But I do think there there's a large chance of low hanging fruits for, for places where, first of all, the, the task is not super hard to define. That you can concretely define this task as a machine learning task. And the second thing is that uh, the place where we have huge amount of data already existing. Uh, so you know, large amount of text, web pages, books, historical uh, data of any sorts. Uh, this places where I have a huge amount of data, uh, like it seems like those are the, the places that we can make easy wins. That's my take. Cool. And in the interest of time, we'll have three more questions. Uh, the panelists will be available after uh, at the happy hour. But uh, kicking off with the next question right here. Just had a question. Um, I'm not an expert on quantum computing, but I was just going to ask. It seems like um, those types of circuits are really good at solving you know, optimization problems and minimization problems. And I believe that's sort of the underlying logic or math behind all machine learning is gradient descent in some form. Um, so do you know of any like efforts or what the progress is on maybe building an analogous uh, algorithm to SGD or, um, yeah, in, for like a quantum circuit? Uh, so Google does have a quantum AI team, um, and there are efforts to build a quantum computer. Uh, I'm trying to think, um, I think they're, they're trying to build like a 53 qubit machine, so it's still pretty early days. Um, in principle, like, so nobody's actually built like a pragmatic quantum computer yet, one that can actually solve practical problems better than a real, uh, like a classical computer. Um, in theory, uh, if you can get the quantum error correction good enough, I mean, you need some more breakthroughs, uh, as, at least to my understanding, before you can build these things practically. Um, but yes, in, it, it, with certain breakthroughs, in theory, it should be possible to build machines that can solve certain optimization problems very efficiently. And then there's a question of, can you leverage that for uh, various AI applications? There are definitely people that are looking closely at that, but I would say it's um, far enough out that uh, I, I haven't been personally following the developments there. Personally, I know extremely little about quantum computing, but I'd like to add some additional points from a different perspective. Essentially speaking, our computing power is bounded by underlying physical laws. There is no way to believe that our current computer architecture, the Turing machine, the von Neumann architecture is already the optimal solution for any problem we are facing. There must be alternative solutions for certain tasks we are facing. I do not know what it is. Maybe quantum computing is one. There could be other alternative computers. For example, a bird with a small brain can already uh, consume little power when compared with a large GPU or TPU, can already do tasks like object recognition, uh, image recognition pretty well with a brain of three gram. This is something we definitely couldn't do 
especially when compared with the weight, when compared with the power. It means that there exists some alternative solution. For example, by using DNA programming, protein programming, that can achieve the same task more efficiently. So I do not believe the twin machine is the optimal solution for all the problems. There must be more efficient solutions. And sh we shouldn't stop looking at those alternative solutions at any time. Awesome, thank you. So, uh, so can I go? Um, with um, with um, our personal profiles becoming more available to any buyer and um, considering the volatility of the social structure across the world, uh, what is Google doing to actually um, maintain our, sec our data, uh, the user security? And uh, are you all personally in favor of regulations for when it comes to our data? Uh, this is, again, a, a pretty important and big question. I have to say that uh, I'm not an expert on that, but I know Google treats those security privacy problems extremely seriously. Uh, we just uh, created thing, uh, something called AI principles. We have a designated committee in terms of reviewing each upcoming AI project, whether, for example, it conforms to the AI principles. In addition to that, Google has dedicated privacy and security review teams for every new project in Google. We need to write a privacy design doc, security review doc, and get it reviewed and uh, approved in order to proceed. And Google really takes those kind of uh, security privacy uh, extremely seriously. Um, so um, adding a bit to that, so um, as a workspace, Google is trying to really build this very inclusive culture that and inclusive and diversity uh, among the work workspace. Um, and I think Google is trying to apply the similar principles to our uh, ML and AI solutions. So trying to basically build AI solutions that benefit everyone and not bias to certain group uh, of users. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll add a, a little bit more. Uh, there are pretty significant security and privacy reviews for all products. Uh, there are significant uh, efforts to protect you know, user data. Um, in, I mean, there's also all kinds of additional rules for various countries like GDPR. Compliance is a big issue uh, where there are uh, like there's large infrastructure in place for auditing and tracking exactly internally what data is being used where and making sure that it's not retained longer than it should be or not retained uh, you know in places where it shouldn't be and so on um, you know Google takes this in enormously seriously there's uh, I mean some issues like Google Plus was shut down um, and I'm not like privy exactly to the reasons there, but I, I imagine that some part of that was to make some of these compliance issues easier. Um, and in terms of kind of what's Google doing in, in terms of uh, trying to protect the social fabric, I think you know, we, we, we have a vested interest in making sure that, that everyone behaves responsibly in sort of the, the ecosystem. We don't want people to feel that they're uh, being taken advantage of. Um, it, it's a it's a challenging project problem in general, um, in terms of like the the people who are aggregating profiles of users and bought and bought and selling them, are typically companies you've never heard of, right? It's not uh, the the big uh, companies that are kind of interacting directly with consumers. Um, yeah, I mean, I personally I would be in favor of of regulations that would protect people's privacy in a lot of these circumstances. I, I think it is problematic. Um, but it's, I don't think it's actually a lot of, it's not Google that's doing these things. Google is not selling anybody's information um, to, to third parties to build profiles. Right. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, so it's kind of a fun question, okay? So we all engineers here, most of us are engineers here, and we're thinking about things exact science, right? Like how precise is it, how good is it, you know, how much, how big, you know, new materials, how good is this materials, this is how we're looking at this new system, this autonomous car, is it able to drive me a certain distance? And this is towards questions of IQ, right? But there is also EQ, uh, emotional intelligence, right? And there is uh, sci-fi, there is some stories in sci-fi, like my favorite one is her, right? Mm -hmm. There is the agent, Samantha. It's a, you know, a artificial intelligent agent. And person is able to develop feelings to, towards this agent, right? So you feel something towards it. And it's possible to do, uh, there was another project, actually your project, guys, it was uh, Google Duplex, right? That people actually believe that they're talking to human being, and at the moment then they felt that, you know, it's uh, artificial intelligence, they felt tricked, and, you know, there was a certain pushback. Because they felt like they've been um, related to something that's not real. They feel like they've been lied upon to. But uh, maybe it's not supposed to be like that because there is social robotics, right? There was Robot Jiba, there is uh, Robot Kiki, which is still active. Uh, there is huge movement in, you know, Japan. Japan, what is it? Waifu, I think it's called Waifu. The hologram that you can talk to and develop certain feelings towards it. So first of all, how do you feel about that, right? And second, if you would want to solve this problem, how would you frame this problem? Is it supervised learning? Is it reinforcement learning? How would you do it? Uh, I like to answer this question first because I did have some experiences related with your question. The problem you raised, computers focus more about uh, IQ rather than EQ is true. But it doesn't mean that researchers haven't thought about the EQ problem in the past. There is a dedicated field called effective computing. It's all about trying to understand what's the feeling of a user. Because online assumption is we spend maybe six hours, eight hours, some people even 10 hours with different computing device, devices. It's totally wrong that the computing device we are using has no information about our feeling. Do not know whether we are happy, we are angry, etc. This is totally wrong. We do not take those things into account 20 years ago for a reason. But now is the right time to take those things into account, either as a feedback mechanism or as implicit input. Uh, also, I would say this is the right time to int uh, introduce effective computing, because in the past, how could we know users' feeling? We can tell users' feeling from facial expressions, uh, body gestures, and maybe physiological signals, such as uh, skin conductance, such as blood pressure, such as heart rate, etc. In the past, maybe more than 10 years ago, such kind of physiological signals are extremely hard to measure. We can measure that, but only in lab environment. But with the more recent technology advances, such as wearable computing devices, small uh, low power sensors, and better on device machine learning algorithms, we are reaching a real era that we can collect and monitor and make inferences from those physiological signals and to help us to know a little better about our feeling, uh, the EQ part of users. Uh, I already did some research in this era in the past. My approach was to use a sensorless approach. Just use a unmodified smartphone what kind of signals we can collect from user interactions? The answer is we can collect a lot. For example, we can collect uh, users' muscle stiffness signal from their scrolling, screen scrolling activities. We can collect, for example, heart rate signal from their skin transparency change. We can also collect, for example, emotional uh, feelings from their facial expressions. We can do a lot of things. What I did in my previous research project was to use those as signals to understand the learning process, to make the learning process more efficient. But I believe that uh, there are a lot of other opportunities, and there are also a lot of other researchers working on that. We are reaching the tipping point of making the uh, computers more emotion aware, 
improving the EQ of computers with today's uh, technology with more recent technology breakthrough, especially breakthroughs in those kind of portable low power sensors. Um, so your first question was how, how do we personally, uh, how, how do we kind of personally feel about, you know. Like humans, uh, yeah. how do you feel towards it? Right, and second, right. you know, yeah, yeah. are you okay and how would you build such thing? Got it, thank you. Um, the first one, I, I think, I. I think in general, I, I feel like it's a positive thing that computers can can have emotions. Like for example, if you have a, there's possibly going to be more and more AI agent type of things that you're gonna have actual dialogues with people helping out with solving any issues you have in life. Uh, it's actually in general good if you feel like you're talking with a person rather than a machine. Like uh, my daughter actually really enjoys talking to Siri because Siri tell, tells a lot of jokes. Um, uh, so for for second thing, um, I don't think it's a, it's a matter of that uh, computers are good with IQ type of problem, but not with EQ type of problem. I think this is more kind of new area that we haven't been uh, dive into yet. I do think there's a lot of potential for that. Like for example, we do have uh, research areas such like uh, sentiment analysis, like basically uh, giving you a picture for cats. Is this cat cute or not? Right. That's kind of really like predicting your how you feel about that picture. Right. Um, there are also kind of medical research, for example, like why are some people uh, more agi more easier agitated than the others? There are actually medical things that you can actually trace back to their uh, structure in their brain that different from, from uh, you can find traces on, uh, at the medical level, on, you know, try, try find, find out the, the relationship between uh, feelings and also, uh, you know, how that actually physically works in your body, right? So I do think these are tractable problems, but it's just um, a, a new, new, completely new area uh, of research that I, I think is going to have huge potentials in the future. Um, so yeah, effective computing has been going on for quite some time. I actually, I'll take a slightly different stance. I think that uh, there are some concerns about machines trying to influence the emotional state of their users. I think that this kind of thing has been going on for a long time. You just see it in different forms, like advertising is, is one, where you know a advertising, you basically had a bunch of people in a room in the 1960s trying to predict what ad campaign would get you to like buy their product, right? And they were trying really, really hard to like manipulate the emotional state of the people who would see the ad in order to get them to buy some product. Um, you know, and, and like people have been trying to persuade each other since the beginning of time, and uh, uh, now we just use like better and better tooling for it. So now we have uh, kind of algorithmic advertising where people try to figure out what videos are, are most appealing to get people to watch and, and what news stories will kind of get them to, to read and, and click on and so on. And I think it's sort of a gradual thing. So the, these systems are actually getting better at, at kind of sucking people into this negative news cycle. And we see it with like fake news where it's actually, it is a serious problem. Um, that like I think people are, are aware of it and are working on it now, but I see this as, as an, it's, it's an extension. I mean, these technologies can be used to cause problems with like, like the fake news cycles, a lot of them are driven by advertiser revenue, right? And, and you have various bad actors that are basically just trying to inflame sentiment in order to get views. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very different than the world imagined in the, in the movie Her. Um, but uh, it, is, it is definitely an issue and we need to think about ways to address this in terms of like identifying uh, whether or not some, some news article is fake or identifying if some particular website is trying to manipulate users in some way. That's kind of um, unacceptable, right? Yeah. And uh, I think I'll skip the second part about how to do this. Awesome, and with that, I wanna thank the panel again